Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to Nina's room. And today, we have a very special video, because I am going to continue reading I Survived the Shark Attacks of 1916. So we never finished reading that book, and I'm going to continue reading it today. Sorry, if you're wondering what's on my lips, it's lipstick, it's cherry flavored. If you can see that my lips are a little bit wet. And I also changed my earrings to these pom-pom thingies that, in case you can't tell. Here, I'll get a close-up. There's a little bit too much white. Yeah, there. All right. So I got a haircut, by the way, if you didn't notice. Yeah, still pretty long, but... At least I got it a little bit trimmed, and I was complaining about getting a haircut for months, but then I finally got it accomplished. My mom has been telling me to get a haircut since beginning of April, and then I finally got it done. And I was like, Mom, I don't need a haircut. Some people in my class have like more long than me, and they don't even get haircuts. But then she said that I would get a punishment if I don't change my earrings, or get my hair cut. So I did both of those things. And I love these earrings. They're so fun. They're so like pom pom. You know, like you can squish them with this. But I obviously can't sleep in them. But, it, it, but I can't talk today. I can't sleep with them on because it, it's kind of, according to the place we went to get the earrings, they said that you can't sleep on with dangling ones. But you can with like regular ones that just go in your ear. But these are dangly earrings, so you can't sleep with them. Okay, anyways, so we left off on chapter 10, and we left off where Chet was experiencing the life when the shark was in the ocean, and he was trying to warn the town, but no one was believing him. And now he thought that going to the captain would work. So let's see if that will work. Oh, my God. Nope. Oh my gosh, I can't find the page. Here. Okay. Chapter 11. Chet stood on the sagging porch of the captain's house. He'd barely knocked when the front door swung open. The captain stood there with a scowl on his crumpled up face. He looked at Chet like he'd never seen him before. Yes, he said. What is this about? Chet's heart sank. He thought of what Uncle Jerry had said, that the captain's mind was like Swiss cheese, full of holes and gaps in his memory. What is it? The captain said. Are you selling something? I don't have all day. Sorry, sir, Chet said. I didn't mean to bother you. He almost turned around and walked away, but he forced himself to stay put. He stepped forward close to the captain and peered right into his eyes. Captain, he said in a loud voice, I saw a shark in the creek. It crashed into me. Chet lifted his shirt to show the angry-looking scrape. The captain stared at Chet's chest. Then he looked into the distance. Did he even know where he was? I know it sounds impossible, sir. It doesn't make any sense at all. The captain looked back at Chet. Sure it does, he said. Chet's eyes widened in surprise. The creek empties out into the... Raritan Bay, which leads right to the Atlantic. Pirates used to come to these parts, buried their treasure all around here. The captain's eyes kept getting brighter. If the tides are high and the currents are strong, a shark could get swept right up into the creek. Of course it could. I saw it happen, Captain, Chet said, more confident now. It was huge, and its eyes, just like you said, Killer eyes, the captain muttered. Chet nodded. Why are you standing here, son? The captain scowled. We need to warn people. I'm getting my boat. 
You get down to that swimming hole. You tell people what you saw. What if they won't believe me, Chet asked. The captain put a hand on Chet's shoulder. His grip was very strong. Go, he said. Chapter 12. Chet started shouting halfway down the big hill. Get out of the water, he screamed. Get out, get out now. He thundered down the path and onto the dock. You have to get out. There's a shark. The guys were all there, but they didn't even look at Chet. You have to believe me, Chet insisted. This isn't a joke. You have to get out. You hear that? Monty, Sid said, there's a shark in the creek. We better get out. Sid hoisted himself up onto the dock, and Mounty and Dewey followed. Was it working? Were they listening? But then Sid backed up and took a running leap off the edge of the dock. He cannonballed into the creek with such an enormous splash that Chet got drenched. Monty and Dewey dove in after him. Hey, Sid called, if the shark attacks me, you guys can split the 500 buck reward from that rich guy. That guy's dead, Monty said. Too bad, said Sid. Oh, shark, Monty called through cupped hands. Here, Sharky Shark, come and get us. They hooted with laughter, and Chet stood there totally helpless. That shark was probably long gone. Nobody would ever believe him. For the next hundred years, people around Elm Hills would be talking about Chet Roscoe. The kid who had said there was a shark in the creek. He'd be a big joke like the captain was. Chet felt like running away, far away, all the way to California. But then he noticed Sid, strangely still in the creek. His face had gone white. His mouth was open like he was going to scream. Chet's insides turned to jelly when he saw the glistening fin moving slowly through the water. What the, Dewey said. Hurry, Chet cried, get out. Monty and Dewey flew out of the water, but Sid seemed stuck, hypnotized. The shark was closer to the surface now, its black eyes almost glowing. It's a massive body looming. They all screamed at Sid. Get out! Hurry! Come on, it's coming! Chet heard a motor in the distance and Captain Wilson's voice shouting, Shark! Shark in the creek! Everyone out! Shark in the creek! Sid still didn't budge. The shark was getting closer. Suddenly, before he had a chance to think, Chet was in the water, swimming as fast as he could towards Sid. He grabbed hold of Sid's arm and pulled him. Chet, is it real, Sid gasped, is it real? Yes, yes, hurry. Monty and Dewey were at the edge of the dock, reaching down for them. Sid hoisted himself up and Chet planted his hands on the dock. The guys all grabbed his arms to pull him up. Chet was almost out of the water when something caught his leg. At first, it felt like a giant hand was grabbing him. Then it felt like hot nails were boring into his cough. It's got my leg, Chet screamed. Pull, Sid shouted. His friends pulled. They pulled and pulled until Chet was sure he'd be torn in two. After an eternity, his leg finally came free. His friends hauled him onto the deck. But then the shark exploded out of the water, its jaws wide open, its teeth smeared with blood. Its gasping mouth was coming right for Chet. And then, bang, a gunshot shattered the air. Time seemed to stop. The next thing Chet knew, he was sitting on the dock. Everything looked foggy and people seemed to be moving in slow motion. He heard muffled noises, men's voices, a boat's motor, and the guy saying his name over and over. They were leaning close, still holding tight to his arms. 
Chet looked down and wondered what he was doing in a puddle of ketchup. Hadn't he cleaned that up? Why was the puddle getting bigger? Chet realized it wasn't the ketchup. It was blood pouring from his leg. The fog around him grew thicker until Chet couldn't see or hear a thing. Chapter 13. Shark kills two in New Jersey Creek. A third boy survives, but injuries are grave. July 13, 1916, Elm Hills, New Jersey. A boy and a young man were killed yesterday, July 12th, by a monster shark that made a shocking appearance on the Mottawan Creek in New Jersey. Lester Stilwell, 11, was killed while swimming with friends in the town of Mottawan. Minutes later, Stanley Fisher, 24, was killed as he bravely attempted to rescue young Lester. Farther up the creek, Chet Roscoe, 10, encountered the shark as he swam by himself. He managed to escape and ran into town to alert residents. His cries of warning were ignored, with most residents dismissing his story as a prank. The boy did not give up and later attempted to warn his friends who were swimming behind the Templar Tile Factory. It was during these efforts that the lad had fell into the jaws of the monstrous shark. He was rescued moments later when Captain Thomas A. Wilson shot at the shark with a Civil War musket, scaring the beast away. The brave youth was rushed to St. Peter's Hospital in New Brunswick. Injuries to his leg and described as extremely grave. Chapter 14. Pictures floated in and out of Chet's mind. Fuzzy picture. Men lifting him off the dock. The inside of Dr. J's motor car. The white walls and white streets of the hospital. Unsmiling doctors shaking their heads. A pretty nurse with a soft voice. And Uncle Jerry who always seemed to be sitting right next to Chet. Was Chet asleep? Was he awake? Was he alive or was he dead? It was two days before Chet decided for sure he was alive and three more before he understood what had happened to him, that the shark had ripped away part of his cough. Another few seconds and that shark would have taken off his whole leg. It will heal, the doctor said, patting the child on the shoulder. It will take some time, but your leg will heal. The miracle kid, said Uncle Jerry. That's what the newspapers are calling you. And it's true. By then, Chet had heard about the others. The boy attacked a mile down the creek from Elm Hills and the man who jumped in to try to save him. Both were dead. Chet's room was filled with flowers and cards from people all over the country but none of it mattered to him. His leg hurt worse than it had when the shark was biting him. The medicine they gave him made him feel sick and woozy. He wanted Mama and Papa, but their train was still making its way across the country. Every time Chet fell asleep, he woke up suddenly, shaking with fear. His bed soaked. With sweat. The tear faded somewhat he was awake, but somehow that shark was always lurking, its black killer eyes watching him, its bloody teeth glistening. Chet had never felt so alone. Chapter 15 it was Chet's sixth morning in the hospital when there was a knock at his door. He sat up. Sure, it was Mama and Papa, but it wasn't. Dewey, Sid, and Mountie stood in the doorway. Uncle Jerry was right behind them. The hospital was a two-hour trip from Elm Hills. Had the guys really come all this way to see him? They all looked a little scared, and Chet felt nervous. Were they still mad at him? Chet raised... his hand and gave the briefest, tidiest wave. And just like that, the guys came barreling across the room, fighting each other for a spot on his little bed. 
They're jostling her his leg, but Chet couldn't have cared less. It'll be in the hallway, kiddo, Uncle Jerry said. I think that pretty nurse likes me. The door closed, and all the guys started talking at once. They dynamited the creek. A guy caught a shark in the bay. Say it's the same shark. It was ten feet long. They cut open its stomach. They found human bones. Of course, Uncle Jerry had told Chet all this, but he didn't stop the guys <coughs> from telling him again. He liked the sound of their voices around him. He hoped they never stopped talking. They told him that Captain Wilson was a celebrity, that newspaper reporters were coming from around the world to talk to him. Your uncle said your leg will be okay, Dewey said. You're going to have a huge scar, Sig said. He sounded almost jealous. Chet hadn't looked too closely at his leg when the nurses changed his bandages. That was when... It hurt the most when they washed the wound. He had to keep his eyes closed tight and bite down on a rag to keep from screaming until the cleaning was done. A chunk of flesh was missing from his cough. He'd have more than a scar. He'd have a limp. Just like me, Uncle Jerry had said, won't slow you down a bit. Minnie keeps asking about you, Dewey said. Chet wondered what Minnie would think of a boy with a limp. Sid moved a little closer to Chet. We're sorry, he whispered. We're sorry for everything, said Melty. Sid looked like he was about to cry. It's my fault. What? Chet said. You didn't put the shark in the creek. Sid laughed a little and wiped his eyes on his sleeve. We should have listened to you, Melty said. If we had gotten out of the water, you wouldn't have gotten bitten. And if you hadn't come, Dewey said, we'd be... But if I hadn't played that stupid prank, Chet said, you would have believed me. You saved me, Sid said. You guys saved me, Chet said. He swallowed hard and then all sniffled a little. Then a hush came over the room. And in that quiet moment, Chet realized something. He and the guys would always be tied together by the terrible things they'd seen, by what they'd done for each other. It was a while before she said, we're calling a truce, no more pranks. As usual, nobody argued with Sid. It was settled. The guys stayed all afternoon until Uncle Jerry poked his head in and said it was time to go. The guys lingered until Uncle Jerry shooed them out the door. Wait for me, Uncle Jerry told them. And then he closed the door and came over to Chet's bed. Your mama called the hospital, he said. She and your papa will be here after dinner tonight. Chet smiled. You know, Uncle Jerry said, straightening the sheet. I had an idea, thought I'd mention it to you. He cleared his throat. Maybe your papa would like to help me run the diner, Uncle Jerry said. It's a busy place. I think you might enjoy it. We do well enough, and I sh sure wouldn't mind having more time to myself. It took Chet a few seconds to understand what Uncle Jerry was saying. Your papa might decide it's time to settle down, Uncle Jerry said. I'm not sure he'll say yes, but I guess it's worth a try, don't you think? Chet opened his mouth to say something, but the words seemed to be all stuck together. So he just thought it. Okay then, kiddo, it's a plan. Chet lay there a while after Uncle Jerry left. He thought about Mama and Papa. He couldn't wait to introduce them to the guys and to Captain Wilson. He struggled to keep his eyes open, but it had been a long day. Before long, he dozed off. He dreamed that he was an old man sitting in a diner telling a story to a gang of boys. He told them about a shark in a creek, a huge killer shark with bloody jaws and coal black eyes. He described how the shark had chased him, how it scared him out of his wits. But in the end, the beast couldn't get him because Chet hadn't been alone, because his friends had reached out for him. They had held him tight, and they never let him go. The end. All right.
So my nose keeps like turning up and there's and I feel like there's a huge bubble in my nose trying to block everything. <coughs> oh my god, that bubble won't go away. Okay. So I hope you enjoyed that really good story. So let's find out what happened to Chet. So at the beginning, Uncle Jerry and the guys never believed um, that captain about the shark. Uh, until one day, Chet came face to face with a real shark. And then he tried to warn the town, but no one believed him. And then after he and, he and his friends... Um, were um actually face to face to a shark and they all apologized and um um and Chet actually knows what it feels like to have a shark's jaws chomped on his leg. So um he lived in an extraordinary time with his friends and I would say it was a summer they will never forget.